All right, and uh, we are live. Welcome to the first 2021 uh, episode and our second episode of How We Would Build This. I'm Chris Schultz. Hey, and I'm Ryan Wagonist. What's happening, y'all? Feels good to be here. Feels feels good to be here. We are uh, <laughs> we're streaming on uh, several different platforms. Uh, we've got a great show today. Great guest, uh, Ben Montgomery from Premium Parking, who we'll bring bring in here in a few minutes. Mm. Um, but uh, Ryan, let's uh, let's let's chat a little bit about uh, what's what's going on in in the world of technology and 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 startups and uh, how's it, how's everything on, in your world. Is there is there anything going on in tech this week? I wasn't sure if we <laughs> if we yeah. wanted to talk about that or not. Yeah, <laughs> I find it. Um, you know, Nashville's Nashville's interesting. I'm in Nashville. I know Chris you're out in California still, but um, man, the online the online business world or the startup world. Um, I think both of those things are emer- are kind of merging together here. Uh, every every week, really, every month, I'm kind of seeing both of these worlds collide. I think there's something we can really learn from each other, but um. Just with some of the censorship stuff that we've been looking at this week in the media, um, yeah, you being in Silicon Valley for you know quite a while, almost twenty years. What, what's your what's your first first and second kind of thoughts of what that what that looks like to change the landscape for this year? Is it as big as we're making it out to be, or or do you feel like it is just hyped via social media? <laughs> Well, it depends on your, I don't know if it depends on your perspective or whether you want to call it censorship or you want to call it uh, enforcing the terms of service. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah it, it is interesting. I mean, clearly we're seeing, you know, what, what you know, technology, you know, with our background, we've been doing this for, for you know, many years um, is, is, now, not just at the forefront of the economy, but it's at the forefront of, you know, of, of politics and, and democracy. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's really, it's really interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and a little bit of a sort of a brave new world in, in terms of, um, you know, how we navigate it. But one thing's for certain is that the, the power of technology uh, to connect people, to disseminate information, you know, it's sort of, we're at the point where it's surpassed the power of TV. It's, you know, it's amazing how, yeah. how quickly the internet has evolved to this point. So, yeah. Yeah. I find it interesting. Um, Naval had a, had a tweet this morning says, not your platform, not your followers. And I, and I'm just really interesting in the sense of, you know, even with Ben coming on here in a minute, um, you're going to hear a cool story about their business and how they've just had awesome scale and growth from being kind of a brick and mortar cement, um, very kind of like, you know, blue collar business. And, um, you know, this year is a lot of people going to be looking for platforms that they can build for themselves. I think, I think that is like one of the most untapped markets, um, that will be emerging in the next four years is these kind of really sovereignty based personal platforms. So, I don't know. I think it's pushing people towards hopefully their biz, their 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 kind of biggest expression online in the sense of actually building the thing they want to build. So I mean that's why we're here, right? How do we build it? You know, there's so many people with creative ideas that are a building, building the next idea inside of the ecosystem of their business already. But then you know, like what would you what would you build? And now's an opportunity where you can do that if you want to. So man, I love I love that tweet this morning. Um, not your platform, not your followers, and it's true. And I think that's just a a, a kind of a cool pathway to what's going to be happening and unfolding here. I think, I think this year in tech, so I'm pumped, man. I, I love it. I don't see it as negative or positive. I see it as is, um, and it's opportunity. So, yeah. well, one of the things that, that, um, I've been talking to a lot of people about is just where we are in the sort of the, the, you know, tech cycle or the startup cycle, mm. or the broader economic cycle, um, you know, we, we, you know, these things tend to run in, let's call it 10 year increments and, yeah. you know, boom economy and then a recession. There is no doubt that through the last year with COVID, we have hit a, a reset, a, certainly a reset in the way we all work and the way we all engage in the world and the way we collaborate. Right. So, um, for me, those times, you know, when, when, when a lot of the, the, you know, 
so to speak, the rats are leaving the ship, the MBAs are all exiting out of San Francisco. It's the builders that come back. It's the builders mm. that stay. And those, those, you know, those people that are, have an idea, have something they're passionate about are really truly focused on building a business. And, you know, those, those, those are the folks that I find you know most interesting, um, mm. and we I, I sort of have this feeling that we're at this beginning of another cycle, right? The last cycle, um, you know, what what we could do with you know our our mobile technology and having this remote control for your life, and all of a sudden you could call a car, mm. you know, an Uber would show up, you can book a apartment on Airbnb, you could sort of do everything you could. Th those companies are now, you know, obviously public and and have gone through this economic cycle. What is going to happen or what are people building that is sort of interesting right now? I think that that's going to change, you know, change our lives over the next 10 years. I think now is that very fertile sort of environment for, for starting new companies. Mm, yeah, that's cool, man. Um, let's see here. Where's Ben at? Hey, I was thinking, Chris, before, before Ben comes on, if there's anybody who's like watching now, um, one of the things that Chris and I do really well is, uh, and we found, I think we found this in the first episode we did, or even just in our conversations throughout the week that a lot of founders or people who are building businesses online, it's really not about this like long-term um, solution to what they might feel is a problem they have. It's rather like in this moment, there's just this nudge that they need out of it, or maybe there's some insight, or maybe we may or may not have that, <laughs> but I, we may. <laughs> and so, so after this, after we bring Ben on, there's gonna be an opportunity for people who wanna kind of come into the show and just ask kind of rapid fire questions. I wanna preface that now before we bring in Ben, just to give people an opportunity to like, hey, hang tight. If you have something that you're like itching to kind of process or a question you have, or um, how would you build it, right? Like maybe you are building or maybe you have an idea to build and you don't know what that next first step is. Um, like stay put, we wanna help you with that. So that would be really, really cool. Yeah, great, great, great uh, point there, and and we will bring you in uh, if you have a comment um, in right now or or at any time through the show or a question for us or Ben, you can post it in the comments on whatever streaming platform you're watching, and uh, Ariel, our producer, uh, can put them up, and you'll see them on the screen. Um, we also can invite you in, uh, and we're yes. going to be doing that at the end of the show. So as Ryan mentioned. Um, uh, we, we can do that. And, um, let's just talk about the sort of the inspiration for the show and sort yeah. of the, the, um, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, the name of the show is how we would build this. Um, you may be familiar with, uh, Guy Raz, <laughs> his podcast, how I built this. Um, so he is sort of, you know, really doing interesting, you know, deep dive interviews with, with founders and CEOs of people who have built great companies. And he's looking in a sort of retrospective, you know, look back on the, on, on that story. Um, I think we're in a, you know, look forward, um, you know, how, how we would build this. This is sort of a, a brainstorm session, a mentor session, a, an opportunity to bounce off ideas. So uh, if you want to join us uh, for whatever our, our take or our, our, you know, nickels worth of free advice uh, would be, um, don't feel like you have to have it fully fleshed out. You know, that that's sort of the whole point here is uh, a fun discussion about um, things that, you know, you, you may be thinking about building. So, yeah. Yeah, come on. And like the, the, the advice I always kind of give is like first thought, best thought. So just like if you have something and you're like, eh, it might not be worth it to ask, just like follow that first thought and and go with it. That's always like stirred me really well in my journey of of building. So um, yeah, that's my only thing I had to say about if you're watching or if you want to jump in, um, let's do it. Okay, good. All right. Well, uh, what do you say, Ryan? Ready to, yep. ready to bring Ben in? All right. Come on, Ben. Um, I'm going to add Ben to the stream and give you yeah. a Hey, hey man. Hey Ben. Uh, ben, let me give you a little, little intro here. Ben is the pres president of Premium Parking, an app dedicated to simplifying paid parking nationwide, offering frictionless user experience to drivers. We'll be bringing him on. Uh, we we bring him on in a minute. We just brought him on uh, to talk about the obstacles he's faced in building new technologies and into an established business model um, parking. You know. And, uh, and bringing technology into that industry and how his own experience can help other business owners anticipate 
mobile user growth uh, in 2021. So welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, Chris. Ryan? Hey, Ben. How are you, man? Hey, real quick before we get started, is that a is that a real burger behind you or is that a fake burger? Because I that, is, that has been my um, you know, Zoom Teams call icebreaker. My <laughs> okay. that in ceramics class. It's a uh, Christmas. It's a it's a hamburger. Yeah, it's a ceramic hamburger that he made. Okay, so I'm doing this like New Year's fast, and I'm like looking at that burger, thinking, "Woo!" Yeah, it's a it's a, good, a good icebreaker. People are like, what is that? You know, it works well. We, we spend a lot of time in front of the screen now, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, Ryan, you want to give us, get us sort of kicked off here? I think you've got a, um, an idea for sort of where to, where to open here. Yeah, Ben, we were just going to um, ask you a quick question. What, tell us a story about premium parking. Like what? I love the, I love the question. Like tell me, tell us a story about premium parking. Well, so the the kind of the story, I mean, Premium's got a, a unique history. We're obviously a parking solutions provider. We started as a parking management company here in New Orleans, literally probably the worst time to start a business in New Orleans. Uh, <laughs> the company was started two months before Katrina hit uh, in 2005 um, and made it through that. I actually joined the company in 08 um, and you know, we ended up being pretty successful in just convincing people to let us run their parking lots. And then I, the way I tell the story is we, we naively decided to build an app for paying for parking. You know, we, we kind of, you know, Jim Yuji, who's the founder and CEO, said, hey, Ben, what if we built an app? You know, we see some people starting to do this with parking. And I said, I don't know. Let's see. And I went and found a you know, graphic designer and a developer and said, hey, what, how much to build an app? And I think the original quote was $15,000. We spend quite a bit more than that nowadays uh, building software and, and designing software and implementing. Um, but that was kind of the initial story. It's just a you know, kind of two naive people running parking lots. And we got into building parking software and now have built a tremendous amount of it. And we have a system called Glide Parks that is you know, the industry leading sort of gateless license plate based platform for running parking. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and there's, you know, parking is an interesting industry. It's, um, you know, it's everywhere. You quickly realize, uh, you know, you all have been aware of premium, but you know, you, you don't see it until you're aware of it. And then you sort of see it everywhere. Um, we have a lot of movies that have been filmed in New Orleans, for example, like there's, I remember there was a scene in Green Lantern where, you know, the aliens like chasing people down O'Keefe street here. And you're just, you know, they, I remember how they filmed it. They put a big, you know, scaffolding on top of a garage. They rented out a whole parking lot, turned it into a market that they kind of crash into. And so you see in movies, a lot of parking signs and things, but it's, uh, it's an interesting, very, like you said, sort of concrete, you know, brick and mortar or maybe asphalt industry. <laughs> uh, and it's evolving pretty quickly. There's been a lot of sort of tech stuff happening in the parks, parking space for years now, for years now. Ben, we were talking about that a little bit in the pre-show. I think you probably heard us heard us chatting. This this last you know sort of tech cycle. If, you know, I don't know that there's a hard you know stop and start, but you were certainly a part of it. In you know maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, we all would have gone into a parking lot and you know sort of expected to pay at a machine or or, or you know a parking meter or, or, or whatnot. But, you know, to what extent now do you think that the consumer, you know, expects, like, I, if, if I'm, if I can't pay on my phone, uh, I'm frustrated. <laughs> if I'm parking not in a premium lot somewhere else. Like, like the consumer mindset is just totally shifted in that I expect things to be tech enabled now, right? Yeah, I mean, I think for sure in the parking, there's, there's so many parking apps you know, that's, that's one thing actually that we figured out. I mean, we, you know, we grew this business in New Orleans. It's a huge tourist market. Um, and we built this app and it was like, you know, we look at the transient, which is like daily, hourly, overnight parkers. And we had, you know, 98% still paying at a pay machine. And we're trying to drive adoption of this technology. And one of the things we did was we built what we call text pay, which was an app list guest transaction. I think you're seeing, um, and it's kind of, you know, you're seeing it in a lot of different ways, you, you know, you search for food in Google maps and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're checking out, you know, in the Chipotle and you kind of don't realize it's, 
maybe getting powered by some other thing. And so those are actually the more interesting things, I think, than the app. And, and you know, it, we, we have an app for iOS and Android. And right now, so just for some data points for you, Chris, like um, in our platform right now, 80% of people, um, and we still have a lot of pay machines out there, are using their phone to pay for parking. Mm -hmm. Pretty massive adoption um, compared to, you know, again, I mean, I think the first year we had 1%, you know, back in wow. 2014. Uh, and so you've gone from, you know, 1% to 80%. We have some locations that you don't even offer a pay machine anymore, which I think is probably where, where we're headed is, you know, you just have a sign that says do this and wow. you check whether it's QR or text or an app you have installed. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting market because I I I had never used premium parking until maybe like three months ago in Nashville. And that text pay, I'm telling you what, it was just like, I can be on board with this. I didn't have to go search for the app or download it. It was just so smooth and so slick. And so I I just want to brag on that that I had I had never used really any any form of text pay in that space. But it is kind of one of those things where you pull up and you got the kids screaming in the car and you're like trying to get a meal and you're like man, I got to park. I don't want to go figure this thing out. Like what's an easy solution. So um, I just want to say well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I think which was actually the most interesting thing to talk about kind of COVID and some of the changing things is, you know, we used to get you know, people in the company say, Hey, we got to do something with QR code. Like mm. you know, that'll get people started in this appless transaction. And I would kind of just, usually just ask the question, when was the last time you used a QR code to that? And they'd say, uh, and I, would say the same thing. I said, I, I'm a pretty early adopter. I, you know, I, you know, I, I'm into tech, I follow it and mm -hmm. I hadn't used a QR code, but that has been probably one of those technologies that has really seen a massive uh, acceleration during COVID. And we've seen it, we had launched a, we did end up building something for camera pay, for QR code, we called it camera pay. Uh, and so you've got the fact that QR code is in the camera apps. Mm. Phones. So that's grown like a thousand percent literally since COVID. I mean, it was like uh, literally not even registering uh, from a transaction standpoint. Now it's, we've got some locations, it's 25, 30% of, of the volume flowing that way. So Every, everybody sort of finally realized that, that their phone has a built in QR code reader, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to download a QR reader, right? Yeah. yeah use the camera app. It's but it's true, true. like it, the touchless the touchless ordering in restaurants and that kind of thing, there has been adoption. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes there's sort of like sleeper technologies that are sort of out there and the early adopters are excited about it, but it doesn't really go anywhere. But then you have this exogenous event like COVID and all of a sudden, okay, here's this technology that's been been there all along, you know, begins to begins to be adopted like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember our CFO did like an MBA program and went to China and he was like, oh yeah, everything's QR code over there. You know, some places you can't even use credit card. You have to use like QR code. And, you know, we've all heard about that. And I don't know if we'll get there, but there's clearly been a shift in the, the sort mm -hmm. of consciousness of, of using QR codes to, to start transactions uh, in the U.S. Sure. Ben, one of the things I wanted to get into a little bit here is um, you 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 talk about um, Glide Park as a uh, as a as a platform, um, and I know that we've had conversations um, about the potential to sort of you know you know, allow others to 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 build on it, you know, yeah. and you know whether it's food ordering or you know restaurants or entertainment, you know, once you once you park to get to a destination, we'll use like the French Quarter in New Orleans as an example. Um, you know, you you now, you know, you know that a customer is there. They've they've parked in the French Quarter. You know, where are they gonna go? What are they gonna do? You know, there's there's sort of a level of engagement and and relationship that you have the opportunity to sort of build on on top of the platform. Yeah, I mean I think um well, that's a, that's a shift that you've seen in the parking industry generally, right? As you've moved uh, from just sort of an anonymous dip of a credit card to, you know, you're putting a license plate in, you have a relationship, you know, things are more, you know, remembers your information. So it's a faster transaction. You get this account-based relationship. You know, parking's always been interesting because it's, it's sort of the first thing you do 
when you sure. arrive to a property or, yeah, come on. or an area of the city. Um, and so, yeah, we, we think there's some interesting stuff there. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, you know, maybe that's a good segue to some of the stuff that's been happening in the parking industry. You had uh, probably the biggest news was you had SoftBank enter the parking management space, if you will. They bought wow. two of the largest parking management companies uh, in in North America, actually. Wow. And they, they created this company called Reef Technology, which is sort of focused on dark kitchens. So they, they've got a little different um, idea, but I think a lot of people are sort of seeing hey, parking is a key piece of this urban infrastructure and how do we make it work better for other urban services, you know, beyond just, you know, parking your car and then and then walking into your building or, or going to the French Quarter. And so, um, you know, we, we definitely see this real estate as sort of an opportunity to onboard into a digital platform. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, whether it's, selling tickets to you know tourist uh you know sites and things like that or, uh, or just having a better experience you know like a building directory you know putting you right into the building directory one of the things we think about is we, we talk about upstream midstream and downstream we're in new orleans and it's kind of an, in, you know, an energy industry term uh you know um, and you know we think a, a lot of what you've seen happening in the parking space the park whizzes and spot heroes and some of these sort of aggregators of, of parking inventory. Um, there's been a lot of work, what I call digitizing parking, right? Like getting these things on maps in the right places with the right names, with the right rates, uh, getting the ability to transact for that and, and get your information so you can actually seamlessly access it. And then you've got this middle piece, which is that transaction. So is it, you know, an app, is it a pay machine? Is it camera pay? Do you have a subscription? Uh, and so there's focus there. And then I think this next piece is, you know, what happens after that transaction? Is there more sort of value we can create in that experience that makes the property enhance um, and, and makes, you know, helps people find what they're looking for? Uh, and so we've done some building directories. One easy thing we did was floor reminders. So what a great time to help somebody remember where they parked, like they do the transaction. And we just say, do you remember what floor you, put, pit, you know, parked on? And you, we, we, we match it to the property. So all the floor names are the same. You click it. And then when you get your alert or you go back into the app, it tells you what floor you parked on. Simple thing, but I'm like, it's embarrassing. I'll go to like a parking RFP meeting, you know, I'll park in the garage. And then like, I'm wandering around with my other coworker. We're like, what floor do we park on? Brian <laughs> doesn't see us. Like we're like the parking guys. We can't remember. <laughs> oh. the parking guys are lost. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, well, we got a question coming in uh, from Jay who's watching uh, right now. You know, this is an interesting question. Obviously, SoftBank, you know, coming in, um, you know, this is something, you know, reminds me of, of uh, when SoftBank started, you know, investing a bunch in, in WeWork and, and we're running Launchpad, you know, what, yeah. what does it mean for us? Um, what, what uh, you can see the question here on the screen, Ben, I'll let you, I'll let yeah. you. Know. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, we have, what's interesting is, is, we started out as a parking company that we'd walk into a client and say, we know a lot about parking. We can run any type of parking. And, you know, we would run parking lots with attendance. We actually ran parking lots with this, what's called an honor box where you like shove your money in these little slots, if you recall. Mm -hmm. And obviously pay machines, there's a whole this debate historically about like pay play, pay by space. And then we've pretty much settled on pay by license plate at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happening on the mobile side, uh, and then we also run, ran gated facilities. You know, when I mentioned glide parks, it was a it's a gateless license plate based strategy, and so what's what's been interesting is we sort of were really broad in the type of stuff we did, and then as we got better at it, we actually got more focused, right? And so I think that's what we we're seeing is we want to be world-class at gateless license plate based parking op operations, which for your viewers, it's it's basically just think about an on-street 
parking experience. You pull into a space, there's a sign that tells you what to do, and then you can walk up to a pay machine or use a mobile app and you pay for parking. It's, it's really just essentially that workflow, but getting really in the weeds on that, how do you get really great compliance? How do you make it frictionless? How do you deal with complex situations like validation? So no, we've, we think it's kind of good. There's a lot of noise and people are figuring out who's managing what and, you know, they're rebranding and there's all this sort of stuff. And, and a lot of people are, you know, watching them and you know, we're certainly interested. I think it's exciting for the industry to have, um, you know, so much sort of, you know, money come into it and then also focus and, and a lot of creativity. The team over there, I think, has got a pretty big vision for what the parking industry uh, really could become. And there's going to be some value created there for sure. But no, we've, we've actually just gotten more focused on, on our, what we're really, really good at. And we think it's a huge market. It's, it's huge. I mean, they have 4,500 parking locations, and they, I'd be surprised if they have 15% of North American market share. Wow. So it's a really fragmented industry. Um, and, you know, there's a handful of national players. There's mm. two handfuls of regional players. And then everybody else are like small local operators for the most part. And just for context, you know, you guys are a national player at this point. How many, how many markets is premium in right now? I'd still consider us a large regional, honestly. Okay. Uh, we're about 40, about 40 markets right now. Yeah. So we pretty much have it covered. We're up in, uh, right outside of Boston, I guess. I used to say we were in Connecticut, but we've actually just picked up something right outside of Boston. Uh, and then we're all the way in Hawaii. So we've got, you know, the whole U.S. covered at this point. But, uh, you know, I think there's, a, there's I'd say there's about four real, I think at this point, true national players. And then there's some some younger, aggressive, scrappy companies that are that are growing quickly and are, are I'd consider still large regional players. So, uh, but they tend to be, you know, the, the parking industry, these larger players, the way they, they, they typically got to be large where they ended up being roll-ups. Right? So mm -hmm. they would still require, mm -hmm. you know, sort of local or regionals. Uh, and so they're, you know, they, they tend to be a little, it's, it's hard to sort of move those shifts, right? There's a lot of sort of partnerships and things. And, um, you know, we, we think we can be very, very precise with what we're doing and get really, Good. We're, we're in a very fortunate situation. All of our locations are running our own tech stack. And so we can sort of improve universally where everybody else in the industry right now is piecing together multiple stacks. So they may use a game arm system. They're using another mobile payment technology. They're using another accounting system. Uh, you know, maybe they're tied in with Spot Hero, another enforcement. So again, you sort of spend a lot of your time trying to get things to work. The analogy I use is you know, I played a lot of basketball growing up and, you know, you spend all your time trying not to dribble the basketball off your foot operationally as opposed to kind of head up, you know, playing the bigger game. And we're, we're in a good spot to play the bigger game right now uh, with premium. Cool. Um, let's put back up. There was a question coming in from uh, Kip. Um, Ariel and I are stepping on each other's toes. Speaking <laughs> Dribble, dribbling the basketball off our toes, uh, you know, about ownership. And this is, this is interesting. This is sort of a, you know, I wonder what SoftBank's approach is, but, you know, asset light, you know, or not asset light owning the lots. Where, where, what is, what does premium do to Kip's question? So, so premium does not own the lots. Premium is a parking solutions provider. We used to call ourselves a parking management company, but we obviously bring technology. And what's, what's a little interesting is, is we're, we're able to engage, kind of in different levels. And so we've really been focusing on kind of what exactly are the deliverables and when do they make sense in different contexts. So now we we, 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 we manage these, you know, or lease them in some cases. Uh, and then in, in some of our newer accounts, we actually are really working with existing operating teams and letting them leverage glide parks and our expertise in gateless license plate where they kind of keep their people in place and then we're coming in and, and, and enabling the software and then training and, and supporting them. So no, we don't, we don't buy a uh, soft bank just to comment on that. I think you know, the, the assets they bought on the parking management space were management companies. Mm -hmm. so very similar mm -hmm. premium 
though they did just announce, I think they raised another 700 million um, earlier this year. And I think that, on top, I don't know if it's on top of that or in that, they have 300 million dedicated, I think, to sort of more real estate investments. Mm. Uh, so, but now premium is focused on helping property owners maximize their assets from a customer service and, and revenue maximization. So, mm. on the on that topic, what in regards to businesses is there? Um, what's the best way for a, a business who who needs parking service to get a hold of you guys? Do you guys have a team they can reach out to? Is there? A- yeah, so we you know we've got a team of what we call market presidents spread mm. right out throughout the country about 25 of them right now um, and they're all parking professionals that have been in the industry generally for you know a long time understand it um, but also really understand what we do um, and they you know we get it's amazing it's, it's kind of been one of the most I mean I've been doing this for 12 years now and before it was all about like reaching out to property owners and trying to just trying to get them to listen to me and you know take a meeting <laughs> Um, and we, yesterday alone, we had five inbound leads on a website come in for people <laughs> asking us to, you know, to give them, you know, a pitch on, on how they could use our solutions on their properties. And so, uh, we still do a lot of, you know, sort of, a, you know, a, you know, cold calls and networking and mm. old school B2B sales techniques. But, um, you know, as we grow and more people see what we're doing and it's unique, you know, hopefully we get more inbound as well. But, you know, it's it's pretty easy that, you know, you reach out, we follow up, we, we you know, we, 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 you know, get the description of your property and what your problems are. And we either tell you, yeah, it's something we could do, you know, add a lot of value for you. And then we send you a proposal or, mm. you know, hey, it's not really what we do. But, you know, here's some other friends that we have in the parking industry. The parking industry is small. Like it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's everywhere, but it's a pretty small industry. And we, we, we used to get together a couple times a year. Uh, we've done some virtual stuff, um, but uh, we're looking forward. It's a it's a pretty social group um, mm. when they all get together, so that's fun. But it's been a while. Ben, I got a couple more questions for you, but but let me just a little interlude to to encourage our audience. Um, we are uh, when we wrap up with Ben, going to take questions uh, or invite uh, audience members in for sort of a quick fire round. Uh, so if you've got if you've got questions um, uh, or if you want to participate, um, why don't you ping in the comments and uh, our producer Ariel or Lauren uh, can send you a link and and we can pull you in. Um, uh, let's see, Oleg's got a question here. We can go to Oleg and then I've got a follow up uh, that's similar to that. So so why don't we uh, jump in on Oleg's question? Sure, Oleg. So he's asking, is Katrina the hardest thing or is COVID the hardest thing for business? Um, I uh, was not with the business when Katrina hit. Um, I was in New Orleans uh, and I was actually working for the, the city at the time. Um, mm-hmm. I had a fellowship as right after I graduated from college. And um, I think they're very different. I mean, if you, if you, if you know what happened with Katrina, it was, if, if you're in New Orleans, it was very bizarre. It was the evacuation of a major American city for uh, months at a time. Um, you had no, a, a huge depletion of housing stock. And so it was just a, a very difficult uh, environment to operate in. But at the same time, it was also when a lot of people were coming together and there was a lot of civic pride and, and things happening. And we're in a different time right now where it's, it's difficult to come together. Uh, and, you know, I've, I told our team, you know, we just, we just went through, what I think without a doubt was the hardest year in the history of the parking industry. You know, we had uh, every single market, right, was impacted in, in, in April. Revenues went down 90%, you know, essentially, you know, the end of March, beginning of April, almost immediately. Uh, we're still, you know, in most cases, sub 50%, or around 50% of sort of same store revenue. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's really, you know, I think COVID is very difficult for parking. I mean, parking is, uh, and, and it's difficult for cities. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting thing that's happened in the last 10 months. Um, I went to architecture school. And so, you know, we spent lots of time studying cities and urban planning. And um, it was really sort of, we were in sort of this amazing moment coming into COVID where cities were booming. We had this massive reurbanization. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we had all these uh, services popping up and we were using technology to coordinate things which were making cities more livable. Um, and, uh, and then all of a sudden we've got to get away from each other, you know, is, is, is what happens. And so, uh, this is a pretty tough moment for the parking industry, but, um, you know, we were well positioned. We've, from a BD standpoint, we've done very well. We've, we've, you know, almost doubled in size. And so, uh, we think we're well positioned as we come back. And obviously our stuff's in, inherently touchless. I'm not, I think touchless has been a little bit overblown. Um, as you look at the data, I think it's a lot more about, you know, people kind of breathing on each other, which is sort of the major issue that we're having from a spread standpoint. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, 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 we're, we're optimistic. We're vaccinating down here in Louisiana. We're accelerating. As you look at the graph exponentially, so hopefully that can continue and we will get out of this thing. So, so uh, let me ask a follow up to that. I'm just curious, and this is obviously you know a little bit of blue sky thinking here because none of us have a crystal ball. But um, you know, to, as a jumping off point, you know, downtowns, you know, CBDs. People were really you know coming back downtown. People were live live work play back downtown. You know, I'm curious if you have you know ideas around. Um, what from a, you know more from an urban planning perspective but certainly parking is a, is a key element there uh, as is office space as is living um where you think things post covid when we get back to the new normal you know won't go back to exactly what it was but um you know offices may be different you know you may have you know more of a flexible workplace where people can work from home and can work from convene in an office um I've heard, you know, a lot of talk, I'm sure in New Orleans, this is probably a likely scenario of, you know, the, the roaring 20s when, when, you know, we've all got this pent up desire to uh, get back together and go to Mardi Gras and hang out and, yeah. uh, and see each other and go to concerts and that kind of thing, you know, with an expectation of sort of a booming, you know, economy for physical you know, sort of, you know, getting, getting people back together kind of thing. Um, what are, do you have any signals or, you know, ideas, you know, sort of where, where do you think we're all headed um, post COVID here? Um, you know, I think when you look at it, like, you know, there's, there's some, we've, we've picked up some traits that I think are going to be really efficient going forward. I mean, you know, I used to travel, you know, probably every other week, you know, going to meet with clients. Uh, I am traveling this week, so that, that that's great to be back out traveling a little bit. Um, but at the same time, I was you know during COVID, I would you know meet with somebody in Philly, and then I'd meet with somebody in Miami, and then someone in Nashville, and uh, it was really you know efficient from a cost standpoint and from a time standpoint. And so I don't think that's going to go away. Um, that said. Um, you know, I, I do think people like to travel. I think people like to develop real relationships in person. And there's there's certainly, while video is great and, you know, the quality of this conversation is really strong, you know, it's different than us, like, sharing a glass of wine and me pouring you, you know, a glass. And there's, there's sort of a different level of connection. Um, so, no, I think cities are going to be okay. I think it's going to be interesting to see how long the office trend sort of holds and, and how many companies feel like they really can be virtual. Uh, we did early on, I remember we did this, we sort of, you know, we're asking these questions like, is office space even gonna come back? And we looked at it and our office costs are about, I think it was like 10 to 15% of our payroll costs that are here in corporate, right? And so we sort of said, you know, let's just think about this. Do we think that having sort of interactions in an office drive 10 to 15 percent more productivity and creativity and all the sort of things that you're looking from your team? And we thought that wasn't a crazy, you know, thing to think about. You know, mm -hmm. That you mm -hmm. be getting 10 to 10 percent more creativity, 10 percent more productivity um, by having some in-person interaction, some real whiteboarding things like that. And so I, don't, I think it's going to come back. I think you're going to see more flexibility. I think business travel is going to be, uh, you know, I think it's going to be impacted, but it may get made up by leisure travel because 
people can now work from anywhere. And so, yeah. you know, you're, uh, and so maybe, you know, that those, those, you know, one day schlogs, you know, to a city and back where you're just exhausted when you get home, maybe those become vacations and you spend it working. And, you know, we, we fill that gap uh, for hotels and, and flights with, with more fun travel than we were before. Um, you know, but again, I think so. You see, one of the cool trends I love to see is this, there was always this little thing called parking day. It was like a, a riff on parking. It was like, we could, we should be using this space in cities for parks, not parking. And it was like park. And then ing was in parentheses. And, you know, you've seen this, it's, I was like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you've seen Tesla and Bitcoin explode, but you've seen the adoption of parklets actually right. explode too. Cause be, you know, people are these restaurants and bars and things were looking around and, there's no more space in the city, but they had this, you know, big, you know, 22 foot by, you know, nine foot piece of real estate right in front of their building that was used for one car. Right. And, uh, and so you've seen that New Orleans has gotten on the train a little bit slower than I'd wish, but, um, you know, that's been an interesting trend. And I think we hopefully are going to use this as something we can build on and, and get better streets, better urban environments out of it. Uh, so I, I'm so bullish on cities. I think people love to come together. Um, I think we'll, I mean, it's amazing what we've done. I mean, if you think about the fact that we have a vaccine right now that, you know, we're maybe disappointed with the speed of going out, but this is pretty impressive. Yeah. There's like oh, this graph of like how long it take, took with other major, you know, major <laughs> epidemics and things that happened and how long it took us to develop uh, a vaccine. And this is like an order of magnitude shorter. And so there's some really wonderful things Mm. that you know, there's some silver linings here for sure. All right. Well, let's, let's take a last question here from Ariel in the audience. Um, you know, speaking of Elon Musk and, and Tesla uh, electric vehicles, I'm, I'm sure that that's a, that's a key component and, and growing uh, component of, of folks who are parking. Yeah. So we, we do, so we've got, two interesting products that are enabled with the gateless strategy. One is called a star space. So this is like a, like if you're in a rush, we got a space for you sort of thing, hmm. you know, ground floor or, you know, right on the corner in the parking lot. And we basically have used those same workflows to create EV charging spaces. And so we've got those in a couple places, but I think you're going to see a lot more of them mm -hmm. in, the next, in the future. I think you're going to see, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, I, I go to these parking conventions and I can tell you three years ago, we were all like shaking in our boots with autonomous vehicles. Like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. parking, the parking industry, you saw these articles, the parking industry is dead. And, um, you know, we had people coming from University of Michigan and talking to us about uh, autonomous vehicles. And, and one of the talks was, you know, kind of, you felt this sea change where, it was kind of becoming reality that, that we weren't going to see these automated vehicles in the very, very short time. Uh, I do think that the, I'm seeing a sea change literally in like the last six months, I'd say, where EV, while it was pretty big in California, they had some new mandates and things with like the percent of spaces that need to be able to charge. You're seeing this where I think there's going to be real sort of market driven decisions being made where you you've got, but it's going to depend on the facility, like a class A office garage. Does it need an EV charging, a bunch of EV charging stations? Maybe not, right? Because most people that are going there have their cars at their house. They're charging them overnight. Yeah. But a garage that services a hotel or residential, you know, those are going to be much more uh, driven use cases that somebody would want to buy, you know, charging from you in the parking facility. Um you know, again, the autonomous stuff is, I think, still incredibly interesting and is going to unlock incredible amount of value uh, in our economy. I think where you're going to see it first, though, and it's going to be interesting to see how this impacts urbanization, Chris, and and some travel as well. I think you're going to see, like, a trip from New Orleans to Houston. I'll, I'll usually fly. There's tons of flights, direct flights, um, but it's only a five-hour drive. Mm -hmm. Right. And if if when I, once I get on I-10, right, if I could just click it into Super Cruise and then do the podcast with you, right, <laughs> it becomes productive time again. Yeah. You know, 
does does the amount of sort of short haul flight decision making get shifted? Does that urban commute become less less onerous? The most expensive piece of a of a commute is the time you waste, right? And so right. if that time doesn't get wasted because you're in super cruise, does that drive the demand up and maybe sort of push suburban living, you know, and suck some urbanization back out of the cities? I don't know. But I think that's what we're gonna see first is this exit to exit autonomy. It's a much easier equation on a highway or an interstate than, you know, navigating Bourbon Street, right? Um, <laughs> with an autonomous vehicle. Yeah. All right. Well, Ben, it's been a pleasure uh, having you join us. Um, uh, do you want to give a quick shout out for where people can find or follow you in premium parking online? Yeah. So premiumparking.com is the, is the website. We're on our marketing team does a great job. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. and, and everywhere. Um, and just reach out. We, we, you know, my, my cell phone number is the contact number uh, <laughs> on the website. B2B. So let see. Give me a call. <laughs> oh, all right. There you go. You heard it here first. If, if you want well, to, I, over, I told, I told marketing, they said, you sure you want to do this? I said, if there's a day when I can't answer all the in, inbound BD, you know, business to business calls, it's the best day ever. Yeah. 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 It's a good day. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate right. it. And thank you very much. Good to, good to see you today. See you, brother. All right. Well, that's, that's interesting. Sort of hearing, you know, about the, uh, uh, tech enablement and, uh, and sort of where things are, where things are going in the future there for premium. Man, follow SoftBank, huh? I mean, if they see it, um, they've got plenty of consultants sitting in a room figuring out what's next to make them a ton of money. So, <laughs> um, I find it interesting. And something I thought interesting, um, Chris was, and this could, you know, I was feeling it for myself, but then also for the audience, a lot of people in the online space or even, even just his journey from, you know, one city to really, I know he said regional, but they are, na they are national with like 240 sites, right. Or plus was, he said, the better we got it, the better we got at something, the more we focused. I think so many people early on are trying to niche down right away um, versus getting really good at maybe something broader and then allowing that experience to, to niche down. So yeah. I don't know who's listening is like, man, I don't, I don't know what to like focus on first. I, I love that. He said like, we, were, we came really good at something and then we were able to actually focus in on a niche. So, which is a little bit more of a reverse engineering compared to like pick this and then focus in on that niche. Right. And I thought, I thought that was really cool. Of, like it's more about, like just kind of putting your work into the world and then allowing that thing to kind of drive you in the direction of what's next. So I don't know, when he said that, that really kind of was, was really cool. So I think seeing that as a pain point for a lot of people that are kind of in the space of building, it's um, just become really good at what you're doing. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting about that too. I've been having a lot of conversations with, with people running companies, running startups, you know, we're all sort of, you know, every, everything is went out the window last year. Right. You mm -hmm. know, and, and, and by the way, some businesses have crushed it and done really well. Doesn't mean it necessarily the year sucked for you, but, <laughs> uh, but I do think that we're in this situation where the landscape has changed. The world has changed. So um, just even if you're not a startup or even if you're not sort of an early stage and, and trying to think about what to build, but you're an existing company and you're saying, okay, now that the landscape has changed, the world has changed. Um, where do I, you know, do I pivot? Do I? I think that, like running, you know, it's the same thing. Running experiments, create a hypothesis, mm. test, iterate, let the market, you know, sort of pull you into that niche, like you're saying, Ryan. You know, you you don't have to, you know, it's the same thing as it's not necessarily starting over, but you know, the same mindset of that sort of open mind of, you know, let me, let me explore what's going on. And um, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, good. Well, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm watching our Lauren and Ariel and sort of, we, we may have somebody else, a guest, uh, we may have Kip to bring in. Um, if so, uh, Ariel and Lauren, if you can make sure anybody has a, a link into the studio, uh, Otherwise, we can we can do it again. Um, we're trying to make the show. Uh, if anybody remembers uh, Car Talk, the old NPR show, you know, click and clack. We want to make this sort of a a uh, podcast version of a of a call in talk show. So um, 
you know, please make it as interactive as possible. If you're watching and, and you want to come in and you want to <laughs> join us on screen, uh, you're invited. Um, we've got to figure out the right uh, uh, method so that it's it's fluid in terms of getting people in here. Uh, and I guess we we will. Um, but please please join us. We we're we're very open. Yeah, they'll be they'll be coming. Her it's a, like just we we're talking about like hurry up and fail. Uh, yeah. yeah, man. So hurry up and fail by joining the joining our show. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a question from Jay. How long do you give an experiment before you either double down or, or pull the plug? What would, what would you say to that, Ryan? Ooh, double down or pull the plug. Um, man, you know, that is such an interesting question because I think that comes down to a few things. Um, what I have this obsession with like how things are started. I think, I think every business in a sense starts with a subtle, a subtlety of fear. Like you're trying to get away from like maybe a nine to five or maybe, you know, maybe you're trying to like, maybe you left your startup to get to, I hope people aren't doing this, but I have seen it often. It's like to, you know, Hey, example this week, right. It's like, um, parlor kind of being kicked out of the social media space. Like there's a little bit of a threat there. I don't necessarily buy into the total reason why they were kicked off. I think there's a little bit of like, um, we just don't want the space more crowded with people, uh, not not in totality, but just a little bit, right? And so I think like, I think it all begins with like, why did you start, right? If you started it um, and you and you did some market research and market matching and you've had one or two people adopt and you've, and you've really kind of flushed it out in person, then I think, I think always double down. But that question always comes down to me of just a little bit more of like a self-worth question do I double down on myself? Do I pull the plug on my, on my, on myself? And so I always look at questions as like a first person and then I attach it to like the business I'm building. Cause I think like, it's always kind of like that question you're asking is really like, what are you asking yourself? And then, and then what is the effects of that answer on your business? So yeah, I love to get really raw and just say like, are you like, where are you not doubling down on yourself or are you trying to pull the plug on yourself? And that's just a, for me, it's a self-worth issue when it comes to founders or online entrepreneurs. That's, um, not uncommon question, but um, yeah, I I think if you love what you're doing and and you're serving people and you're able to make um make an income, which I think is also equally valuable because you got to feed kids and stuff. Well, unless you don't have any, yeah. then then keep going, man. But for me, it's like if I ever get to that moment where I feel that, then then I know that I probably didn't start it in the best energy, or I'm trying to create out of scarcity. So that's kind of my my personal perspective. Yeah. Yeah. When that question emerges, it's deep. It's a deeper, rooted reason. Jay, uh, let me see if I can get this to. Um, we'll see if that if if uh, Kip Kip gets that link I just just sent him. Okay. Um, let me weigh in on on Jay's yep. question there. Um, Jay, one of the experiments, a way to sort of validate. Uh, you know, I always think is focus on your customers. If you have, if you have any adoption, right? If you're trying something, um, focus on your customers who, if it went away, if whatever you're doing stopped, if you pulled the plug and you said, I'm not going to move forward, they would be pissed, right? They would be like, like, here's a good example. StreamYard, the platform that we're using, I did a lot of research sort of finding this, um, StreamYard got acquired recently, and I was worried that they're going to shut down the product, which often happens after acquisitions. If they did that, I would be pissed, right? Mm -hmm. it's a great platform. It's the best platform out there for streaming. So I actually think, and then and then you start honing in on those quest those customers that are really utilizing their your product. They're not just logging in because you're sending them prompts and you have to, you know, you're reminding them or whatever, but they're truly utilizing it. Um, I think that's a really, those are, those are really, you know, sort of important signals um, if they're truly utilizing your product. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, Kip in. Hey, Kip Lynch uh, is joining us um, and uh, very, very excited to have you. Welcome, Kip. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ryan. Both y'all been very uh, informative already. <laughs> All right, good. Um, and uh, we're uh, excited to you know sort of get a chance to chat and um, and and work together. Um, 
uh, why don't you why don't you uh, give us a sense of, of what you're working on with Miho and, uh, and and we'll chat about it for a few minutes. Well, sure. Thank you very much. So I uh, am working on what I call a healthcare logistics and vendor relationship management platform to help uh, uh, start to improve the healthcare user experience for patients and their layperson caregivers. You know, their families and their family and friends who are helping them sort of navigate the healthcare system. Mm. Um, and it's something I started working on several years ago and then had a little bit of a hiatus just for personal, professional reasons and got sidetracked. But I'm now, as you alluded to, working with you all, I'm very excited about it. What is the, um, Kip, t tell the audience real quick why you built it. Cause I know, I know th this comes back to something that we just talked about a second ago, Chris is like, um, a lot of products, I, I think it's kind of, it could be split, but some products are just market fit and, and you know how to code and make a brilliant product and, and bada bing. But I also love products that um, were created by because of a personal problem or personal pain or something that was actually something in your life that you're like, man, I, I had this struggle. I needed a solution. So I'm going to see if I can help other people. So I'd love I'd love for you to just tell real quick, like, what was that in your in your journey to like want to create create this app? Sure. Well, thank you. That's good. Uh, good question. I am a physician. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm also a father and a son of a kind of an ill father. And so basically it's, I've had it from various different perspectives. From those perspectives, I've seen the uh, frustration people have just interfacing with the healthcare system. I mean, I think anybody who's spent any time with, you know, people more than just maybe a routine physical exam every year mm. uh, has, has experienced a lot of frustration with the inefficiencies of the healthcare system. So really I was building it to solve a problem I have a and B just as a reaction to all this, it just frustrates me to be part of a system that people kind of complain about, rightfully mm -hmm. complain about. It's just an inefficient, complex, wow. confusing, siloed um, ecosystem that people try to navigate. And it's, uh, you know, buzzwords like platform and ecosystem I'm probably using incorrectly, but yeah. You know. uh, no, that makes sense. I, and I, and I, and I, and I, we kind of share that kindled spirit because before, before my time, like in the in the entrepreneurial tech space, I was and was in the medical field. And you're right, man. It's like there's just this there's just lack of listening or empathy towards the people that were actually serving, but not just the people, but the families who actually have to take on the burden of the schedules, of the appointments, of what the doctor did or did not say. Right. So it's really this ripple effect into homes and and sickness in general creates an, an not the best ripple effect initially. I think maybe long term it can have some benefits to pulling people together. But um, tell us, like, what what is it that you're building specifically, and what if you have any questions of how you would build it, or how do you want to build it, or what the next phase is for your business, or um, how we can help? Well, so the the initial part of this business, you know, I hope it will sort of expand. You know sort of alluded to things like that. Like once you get going, you become more focused on what the actual deliverables are. <laughs> but the beginning, uh, the first phase is basically going to be this app and it's essentially going to have seven or eight different main functions. And the first two we're starting to work on are just appointments and tasks and appointments, for example, are just, I mean, the prime example, I'm leaving to take dad to the doctor in about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, ironically or appropriately, but yeah, the appointment, uh, features essentially like a calendar, but right now we're dealing with my dad and he's got, you know, two or three appointments a week. And my, he has a little crew of caregivers, me, my sister, his former office manager, the home health nurse. And we're constantly texting back and forth about who can take him, who's going to take him, when the appointment is. And it, there are about eight different text chains between various, you know, members of that little team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel because we obviously all have text and we all have email. But I think having all of that in one HIPAA compliant space will be helpful. So that's appointments. Tasks, for example, is, you know, pick up dad's walker at the you know medical supply store, you know, go get dad's prescription. So you'll be able to post that. I kind of think of it like a bulletin board almost. You know, you'll post that task and then you can see who's accepted it. So I post the task and then I say, OK, my sister has accepted it. So I don't have to worry about it anymore. And then when she's done it, she can click mm -hmm. on it and complete it. So those are the first two. Um, I'd like to add sort of a medical records component where you can keep the documents you need. Uh, a big part of it is being able to navigate between the healthcare silos. And sort of my thesis is the patient and their crew of caregivers is the one common denominator between different healthcare silos. 
Mm. I think it's interoperability with Epic and Cerner and all that grows. That may be less of a need, but for now, uh, I think that's important. Wow. Uh, maybe going to do one of the other features is a uh, video or just audio visit summary. You hand it, you know, when the doctor is explaining to you what we're going to do, hey, we're going to start chemo and for fever increases, we'll stop it. So you can have that in there and then share it with other members of the care team who aren't there. So those are some of the features. And I'm fighting the notion of feature creep or the problem of feature creep. That was something I wanted to kind of ask y'all about. Like, how do you know, Maria, who I see is on the call, has been very helpful with that. But, you know, I keep thinking of these things and I keep wanting to add stuff and add stuff. How do you manage that? It's one of my biggest questions. Did you just pick a couple things and do it and, and see what happens? It, it, that's a great question. I think that's a that's a fundamental question of of technology uh, and and uh, and building products. Right? What are the what are the core uh, features or functionality that you want to release, and then you you sort of introduce new things in a very iterative approach. Um, uh, it I, I think it it comes down to you know what are what are the you know in an MVP, you know, minimum viable product kind of way, what are the things that this thing must have in order for it to be useful, right? In order for it to provide utility. And then, you know, being really rigorous about essentially putting things that, you know, are ideas and they would be great, but putting those in, you know, the ice box, so to speak, we'll, we'll put those on the roadmap, but uh, let's get those core features that core functionality uh right and i think you know you described um the the you described sort of the scenario that you know i would be kind of working towards here is you know as you know you and your family or other users you know as soon as you're if you have the app but you're using other tools as soon as you start to replace those text threads you know, with VHO and you're starting to utilize the product in lieu of however you're doing it now, then it's starting to work, right? So focus on, you know, getting those, you know, those early traction points where this is, this has more utility, more true utility to, to the group of, of users, you know, the, the core group of, you know, like caregivers, uh, and then, and then add in things after that. But I think, that that level of focus is is really difficult for you know founders or any you know product people it, you're constantly going to have new ideas of, of things you can add in and you really have to be sort of rigorous to keep those out until you know the the core things you're working on are are actually working and and being adopted mm -hmm. yeah i want to i want to pick it back here because i love i love these shows for for example anytime you get people in a room and there's ideas floating around what was the question Jay asked? Like, when do I double down or when do I, when do I pull the plug? Right? Like a very, a very similar energetic question Kip is because it's like, let's look at this thing four years down the road or five years down the road. Maybe, maybe something changes in healthcare where things do become a little bit more available for everybody. Would this product be a brilliant product fit in a more maybe healthcare socialistic environment? Probably, right? There's gonna be a lot more responsibility put on the family and the caregivers in that circle than maybe the healthcare system. Um, you know, picking the, the top four features that relieve the most mental anxiety was something that kind of came to me. We're sitting here because for you, it probably wasn't necessarily the physical actions. There's really the mental stress of having to manage four, five, six, seven, eight different apps. And then inside those apps, different text threads, and then trying to loop it all together. So it's really a trying to ease the mental anxiety of already is emotional anxiety of a family or a loved one being sick, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like these different stacks that I think I see happening already inside the psyche of the person, which I find is really interesting. So you really, you really have a really cool, I think a really cool technology that, that if put in the right market and slowly released with four or five features that relieved maybe your, the most anxiety that, that you and your family have and being okay with that. And then knowing that, you know, I'm going to continue to develop this thing at whatever pace I, I, I choose to or the market says to is is a really good place to sit. So I, you know, I think it's probably one of those things we've talked about a little bit before in the past, Kip, is just awareness and easeability. So whatever, whatever the people who are trying to care give like you and be like, what's the easiest thing I can give 100 people 
to make their lives easier. You know, I think that if you can make those features really clear, um, to me, that just feels really good. So that's my, that's my thoughts on that, man. Uh, Kip, I know you, you have to run, so we'll give you an opportunity yeah. to, to escape in a second here. But I, I wanted to you know add on the Ryan's comment. I, I agree. Any family, you know, we, we've been, we've been through this. I've been through this with my father, you know, now almost 10 years ago. Uh, and, you know, he, he talked about, man, if there was just a technology that, that would help us sort of, this is, this is a complex process in navigating this. And I think your patient and caregiver centric mm. approach uh, makes a lot of sense because then you can work outside of really complex integrations into, you know, big, big software systems um, that, that are, that are just going to be difficult to navigate. The other comment is in a COVID world, we're seeing how difficult right now um, families, you know, navigating the healthcare system without being able to see each other. Right. I mean, that's, you know, heartbreaking and really challenging and just, you know, being able to coordinate with each other when, when you can't see each other, which is a, a restriction that a lot of families have right now. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, great comments. I do have time for one last quick yeah. question. Do y'all have time? Come on. I, you know, I read and I forget the company it was published in the Atlanta Business Chronicle four or five years ago. It was some kind of hot shot young guys starting a company that was doing well. But uh, hey, Chris, they were, they were talking about the last time I saw Chris in person, I had hair like his. <laughs> um, it took it. Um, <laughs> the They had this notion of just drive user adoption. We're trying to drive adoption. Don't worry about revenue. The revenue will take care of itself later. I'm obviously in this very early stage and you probably, the answer is probably you have to do both, but what would y'all say to that? That's a good question. Ryan, you want to take that? I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in too, but uh, any thoughts? Oh, hmm. Yeah, we've, you know, I think, I think I've, there's a few things that kind of come to me. One is, one is I for sure think that there that there is a season where you, and I don't know, maybe that's at a local level where you're able to partner with a, maybe like a, I love, I love the testing as small, maybe like an outpatient surgery center where, you know, it's not going to be long, long form care, but people that could come in, use it for maybe a short period of a recovery of somebody like that gives you kind of like a ecosystem or a container that, um, you know, there's kind of like a beginning and an end in the recovery process of an outpatient sur surgery center. Right. Um, and, and I think like finding a way to test in that environment for free for an extended period of time and then, and then selling the value, not just to uh, maybe groups of people and that might have to come in, in a different form, whether that's, um, you know, awareness um, inside of maybe some nursing circles or publicly. But also I think it'd be interesting is find a way to either, maybe not license it, but in a way where like there's a big hospital system where, you know, maybe a lot of these, I don't know if you as a physician, you would know better than me. Do you get tired of the family members asking you the same question over and over again? Or do you have a VA that's a nurse that's getting the same phone call, right? Like there's something really interesting in the space of like leveraging or taking away some of that, those micro moments, those times that you might have to take up as a physician or your PA or your nurse where a hospital, it could be an interesting play where a hospital is kind of like purchases it or uses it. And, and it's something that they promote to their customers. So I'm always looking for like, where's, where's the end user? Who's going to really benefit from us? Both going to be the family and a hospital potentially. So for me, I would say like, do it, do it for free at first, get like a real cool opportunity. Cause you can really create some cool marketing around this. And then, and then I would say from there, um, one is like, either you kind of do the personal monthly thing, right? Or you, or you do kind of something where you're finding a partnership at a hospital where it's kind of like a lump sum licensing of the, of the technology. I don't know if licensing is the right word. Maybe Chris can help me kind of figure out what, but the, the thought I have is putting it in that market where you don't have to sell to a hundred people. You could sell to one big person. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. And you and I have talked about that a little bit back when we first yeah. started talking. That's helpful. And I thank you for yeah. it. And I would love to stay on. You can hear my phone ringing. It's because I'm going to <laughs> my dad off to take yeah. him to the doctor. Okay. But, uh, been very helpful and I appreciate it. It was nice to hear from Ben and, you know, see you guys essentially in person. 
Yeah, likewise, Kip. Good, good to have you on today. Uh, we'll let you go because I know you've got uh, obligations with your with your father, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get a chance to have you back on and and talk more. I would love that. Thank That's you, cool. guys. All right, yeah. take care. Thanks very much. All right, I'll I'll put up a couple uh, you know comments. Uh, Kip won't be able to be able to answer this, but um, we had some some interesting thoughts here. Uh, and uh, you know, Lauren makes a good point about HIPAA. Um, you know, fortunately, you know, with with FlatStack, we've we've had experience with HIPAA and and medical uh, products. It is complexity that that you have to really make sure you're um, you're 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 maintaining confidentiality. Um, but uh, but but that's a good point, and I think the you know opportunity to to grow so that the doctor is you know potentially directly involved uh, in VHO would be really cool. Really cool. Mm -hmm. Probably some HIPAA compliance you know components of of that. Um, but I, I like I like where you know Kip is coming from you know from the standpoint of building a company when it is rooted in personal experience um, of going through something, when it's rooted in, particularly for healthcare, when it's, um, you know, being designed and, uh, you know, con concepted by a healthcare professional, by a doctor, yeah. doctor, you sort of understand the landscape. I feel like things like this uh, are really difficult to build when you're just a startup founder with an idea that is in a, complex landscape like healthcare. So, uh, you know, I, I think he's coming, he's coming from a really interesting place here. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's, I think one of the funny things about the, about the creative space, I, I kind of lump creativity into online business or, or Ben, they're having to be creative, right? There's a, there's something really like this 2021 where there's a, there's this, we've always kind of seen creativity as like in the arts community, but man, this creative energy, trusting the creative things that are coming to you is really kind of entering into tech it's entering into mainstream is entering into online businesses and so i think you know for a kip is like get from one to ten like you have your one then like get 10 users right and yeah. trust trust that the trust that thing that said hey go build this and like there's so much life in between that subtlety that whisper of like trust and then and then creation that it's easy to want to like pull the plug or double down right so um man if you could if you kind of just hold hold that space between that thing that said hey you should go do this because it didn't just come from nowhere like he had an idea yeah uh, because of a pain point right like so i love the idea like just honoring the idea like honor the idea that you like man i could really use this if you had to shoot man i i, I agree and i think back to the question that he had for us um he had to go and I, I didn't get a chance to weigh in but i'll share now and and uh, maybe he'll get a chance to talk this. but um i i think that sometimes silicon valley and sort of the tech media does a tremendous disservice to the rest of the industry by you know like the old you know reed hoffman sort of blitz scaling you know mm -hmm. There's so much, we talked about SoftBank earlier with Ben, there's so much in sort of Silicon Valley zeitgeist that says, well, if it's not a unicorn, it's worthless, right? Yeah. And that is just, that, like, that might be true as a, as a late stage VC that you're not going <laughs> to you know, make money on, you know, a business that may or may not exit or maybe a, you know, good, you know, 10, 50, $100 million business, but VCs may not be interested in that, but what happens with that is you get these, uh, you know, sort of programs and it sounded like you went to maybe an accelerator program or a seminar or somebody, you know, and there was a startup person that was saying, don't charge, don't, don't, no, no barriers, just user adoption. And that is mm. like, that's like one model. And maybe if you're building a consumer product and maybe if you're building something like Twitter that you're trying to build a platform, but, um, you know, Kip, could have a very successful company here charging, you know, maybe after you get, like you said, adoption of 10 families using it and they really are using it, you're like, hey, I'm gonna charge 10 bucks a month. And then, you know, yeah. people value it and pay for it. There's there's nothing wrong with that. And there's no, there's certainly no one size fits all for how you should build a tech company um, and a focus on 
revenue, you know, revenue is the best source of financing, right? Everybody focuses yeah. on how do I raise money from angels and VCs and everything and, and just charging for what you're building and getting some people paying for it is pretty tremendous validation. So uh, yeah. maybe not the first thing, you know, I wouldn't build a Stripe integration and be building <laughs> till you built your core features, but not being able to charge once people are actually using it, I think is, is something. Keep well, I think it's a, maybe we can talk about this on the next show, but I, I love, I love the conversation of money because I think it, um, you know, especially for Kip, right? Like the idea around charging, it's not, a, it's not about, is the app worth it? Is the technology worth it? Is the time worth it? It literally, I think in that situation could come down to like your marketing, your copywriting and your invitation to help ease pain. I mean, that's pretty much like basics one-on-one for you know what is it free or not free and i think i think even just like in the startup community there's there's still some funkiness around like what actually is money like you know ha have we seen the have we seen the gold that backs up the trillion dollar covid you know pump bumped into the market no like we, we're printing it and so um i just think like the value of it's interesting to me like what's the value like should i should i not and you know sometimes it just comes down to hey man this changed my life this app um it can change yours. And, and, and then I think people don't think about the money. I don't when like, there's something I really need to really want and it solves something in my life. I just don't, I just honestly don't care. So I don't know. I, I think that's interesting. I, I love what you said there, Chris. That's, that's a good call. He doesn't need to go, you know, and have 500 adopters and, you know, prove that it works, man. Like it works Yeah. <laughs> full stop as they say in England. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I feel like we're we're at a good good time there. It's been uh, fun, Ryan. Um, really enjoyed the conversation today. Um, thank you to Ben and Kip for joining us. Thank you to Ariel and Lauren, uh, our producers on the show. Thank you to everybody uh, across the board from the Flat Sack team to everybody else who's sort of tuned in today. Um, final final thoughts, Ryan. Um, final thoughts, join a community launch pad, maybe, and, uh, ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're here to help. This was, uh, hopefully, hopefully some of these nuggets. <laughs> there's, there's two people at least Ben and Kip. So we yeah. gotta, we're going to follow our own advice. We'll, we'll get, we'll keep going. Right. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for joining us today, folks, and uh, we will see you uh, in a month for our next show of the year, and yep. uh, we'll be back at it. All right. See you all. all right. So long.